Unai Emery may have found the solution to the big problem. Deserbys Brighton. Aston Villa beat Deserbys Brighton six goals to one. And today, tactically, we're going to analyse some key principles that Unai Emery used to beat one of the best possession teams in the footballing world. Brighton have scored more goals than any other Premier League side, but Aston Villa were fantastic in defence, but also offensively forced Brighton into areas they didn't want to defend. This season in the Premier League, like last season under Deserby, Brighton have basically set up in a 4-2-4 shape, with a lot of emphasis on the strikers dropping in to get on the ball and the wingers holding the width a lot of interchange and rotation in midfield, fullbacks in really attacking areas, but also complementing the possession shape. They've been so difficult to play against. This season, they've destroyed Man United at Old Trafford. They put in some great performances, but Emery may have stumbled on all the answers. So first and foremost, let's talk about that defensive structure that Emery used against Brighton. It was a really interesting setup. It's something that I've been theorising about. Press Brighton high in a diamond with a wide midfield and then drop back into a compact and high 4-4-2. Squeeze the play and make Brighton play through an area they don't want to do. In terms of from a tactical perspective how that would look, of course, or how Aston Villa made that look, they played a diamond midfield. Douglas Louise pushed up a little bit higher to put pressure on the central midfielders and um, Diaby and Ollie Watkins sat deep. Zaniolo dropped back, John McGinn dropped back and Kamara operated at the base of that kind of diamond in defensive sense. They pressed in certain areas, uh, Brighton's fullbacks of course, nice and high, um, with the reaction of course that the ball was played, you know, either wide left or wide right, the outside midfielder would go and shuttle out and deal with that. As Brighton built through and got into the mid-block, uh, Aston Villa would drop back into a 4-4-2 shape. Again, blocking off the passes into the central midfielders, being super aggressive, super compact, and playing a high line that kind of exposed them in behind. But it also made Brighton have to play the perfect pass, or Villa would win the ball back, and they'd break into the channels in behind. And this was a tactical setup. Pressing with a diamond high up the pitch, then dropping back into a 4-4-2, shutting down all the passing options, Options, playing a high line, being aggressive in certain moments and winning the ball back in great areas. So let's take a look at that defensive setup. So we dive into the game on three minutes. You can clearly see the diamond that I'm talking about. We've got Aston Villa's midfield, Zaniolo just out of shot at the left side of the diamond. Uh, we've got, of course, Kamara sitting a little deep. Douglas Louise advanced and John McGinn in a halfway position, able to kind of shuttle out and deal with the fullback, but also engage higher if he needs to. From this position, Brighton haven't really got any ball-playing options. The solution that Deserby had against Manchester United's narrow diamond was to play the two centre-halves a lot wider and draw Manchester United's diamond over to one side before switching the play. Because of the nature of Aston Villa's midfield diamond, it covers, covers more lateral space, which means that move's not on, but also with Aston Villa's centre forwards, that they were defensively perfect against Brighton and consistently blocked off the passes into the two central midfielders to stop that Brighton progressive play. In this instance, on three minutes, there is just simply no options for Lewis Dunk. The pressure's really good. We can see the man-to-man -man orientation there with Ollie Watkins and Diaby picking up the two central midfielders. And that leaves only one thing, a low percentage ball from Lewis Dunk that gets eaten up. That was a constant theme of what Aston Villa did in the Brighton half. Squeezing with the diamond, don't put pressure on the centre halves, wait for the first pass and then engage. So that's a concept that they use throughout the game. We can see it again on 18 minutes. This is a really nice passage of play because it highlights a number of the really important things that Unai Emery's side did. Number one, that same setup. Douglas Louise playing high, Ollie Watkins and Diaby picking up the central midfielders, blocking it off. John McGinn's again in that halfway house position, just bottom of shot. What I like about this is that Villa aren't too aggressive. You know, at times you potentially would see other teams, Manchester United, a great example of this, jumping from that centre midfield position to pressurise the, um, the centre half in the wide area. Again, opening up massive amounts of space behind him for balls into the feet of the forwards or alternatively balls out. What I like about this is John McGinn is so aware. He's looking over to see where Esther Pinyan is. He's having a look. Is he, does he need to engage Esther Pinyan? Can he engage the ball? 
or is he going to wait to make the right decision? We can see Diaby starts to make the move over. As Lewis Dunk has the ball, acres of space, Villa very happy to have um, Brighton in this position. There's no threat in the central area, there's no threat over the top, and you can clearly see that defensive structure really working. We're blocking passes still into the two central midfielders. Douglas Louise again, is analysing the situation. He's looking where Danny Welbeck's dropped to drop back into left central midfield, and John McGinn is in a perfect position. Aston Villa from these types of possessions would engage on the halfway line and we can see this Lewis Dunk starts to carry forward and as soon as they're near that halfway line John McGinn shapes doesn't go but he shapes to go and put pressure on the ball forcing Lewis Dunk back on himself um, and again you can clearly see the Aston Villa setup from this moment we've got the two strikers we've got the two banks of four in a really good sort of uh, defensive setup you know good for pressure you've got John McGinn high you've got Kamara covering uh, you've got Douglas Louise ready to press and engage if it goes into central midfield but also the the, the the line is super high it's you've kind of got to play against Brighton like this you have to play with a high line you have to basically uh, you know force them into these areas by blocking off that central space. If they want to play the low percentage ball or a through ball in, in behind your defence, it's going to have to be perfect. And that's why on Emery's side, we're able to play so high, playing that offside trap, which again, they've been criticised for in the Premier League. I think it's absolutely fantastic, but it will get caught out at times. In this game, it wasn't. So of course, you're forcing Lewis Dunk into an area where he's not a threat. He's driving inside and simply there is no central progression on. You can see Derby's uh, shadow is covering that central midfielder. Douglas Ruiz are ready to jump on Billy Gilmore. You've got, you know, Danny Welbeck as an option, but Paul Torres is quite close. Kamara's covering the ball into uh, Evan Ferguson. It's absolutely perfect. This is something I've been saying frequently to deal with Brighton. Sometimes you've got to go man-to-man -man with your centre-back and their forward just to put pressure on them just to not allow them to take that touch to calm themselves down and get turned like Danny Welbeck had the freedom of Old Trafford a few weeks ago. Uh, so the ball's played back to um, Adam Webster. You can clearly see that central area is perfectly covered with the two Villa strikers, the two central midfielders, and Pau Torres is being aggressive. This is a classic Brighton play. This is up back through methodology. Uh, the centre-back into the feet of the striker, little layoff. Um, to the central midfielder and then you're going to look through again. At this point, I think the, the Villa defensive line is great. It's in a kind of 3-1 structure. You're being aggressive, one of the centre-backs. Uh, you know, you, you've got a good defensive line. But this pass from Billy Gilmore is difficult. Number one, you know, the ball is absolutely fizzed into the feet of Danny Welbeck. Danny Welbeck has to play quickly because he's got pressure on his back, so the, the layoff isn't that good. And the ball's at absolute speed into Billy Gilmore's feet. He's got to play the perfect pass to, to free uh, Solly March in behind. Again, Again, the pass isn't perfect. Villa simply retained possession. And that was the game that Villa were playing. Blocking off that central area, being aggressive on the forwards, dropping off the line, and making you play a perfect pass if you want to get in behind. So moving this concept on, this is the second Aston Villa goal. It's a similar thing, similar setup. 4-4-2, counter-attack into the channels, but absolutely fantastic in terms of the coverage. And we see why uh, that Brighton have to get things perfect or they're in situations like we kind of described on the tactics board where if you lose the ball at the wrong time, you know, let's say you're dropping it into Joel Veltman and his touch isn't good enough, the break is on with Zaniolo or the break is on with a Diaby in possession or Watkins in possession. And that's exactly what happens in this goal. So Lewis Dunk in possession again, looks for Adam Webster. We can clearly see that structure we mentioned before. We've got the... Uh, Centre forwards, you know, covering that pass into midfield. At this moment, of course, you, you Brighton have rotated their positions where the central midfielders has joined the attacking line. So Villa at this point are kind of, you know, dealing with not only Billy Gilmore, but they've also got to consider where Joel Veltman is. But you can see the 4-4-2, it's so compact. Uh, John McGinn's going to make a move and join it in a second, but it's so compact in its sort of distance between that midfield and defensive line. Brighton are a team that want to play through your lines. Villa's compactness, absolutely brilliant. Which leads to situations like we see with this second goal. Um, again, you've got great cover shadowing. You've got great man-to-man -man play. Uh, Zaniolo on Joel Veltman. You've got, of course, Pau Torres on the back of Danny Welbeck. Basically, you have got a thread, an absolute pass into the feet of either of those forwards. It gets played into Joel McVeigh. Veltman's feet. He takes a poor touch because of the pressure on his back from Zaniolo, which frees Diaby, who consequently frees Ollie Watkins in the channel, breaks into the penalty area, cuts inside, and gives Villa a two-goal lead. But that all comes from that defensive setup, 
the 4-4-2, the high line, the compactness in between lines, and then attacking in the channels where Brighton's shape is at its weakness. It was brilliant from Emery in terms of counter-attacking, pressing, defensive structure. Creme de la creme. Emery has found the answers. How to defend against Brighton and Hove Albion. So we spoke about how you defend against Brighton, that compact 4-4-2, pressing with a dime, but how do you attack them? I think there's one key principle that's catching Brighton out at the moment, and that is throwing both of your fullbacks forward, which creates space in the inside channels for combination play. So in terms of Aston Villa's setup this season, they have lined up in a 4-4-2 structure. But when they have possession, what we tend to see is Zaniolo moving inside, John McGinn moving into a central kind of midfield position to get on the ball, and both fullbacks pushing high. Why this works against Brighton is you create a back six. So Brighton tend to track your fullbacks with the wingers. What this means is you've actually got a qualitative overload in the wide areas. What I mean by that is that let's say we've got Mike Cash up against Matoma. Matoma is brilliant from an attacking sense. A great dribbler will beat you 1v1. But Matty Cash is a good carrier of the ball. And as the advantage, from my perspective, dribbling versus Matoma. Or alternatively, if you're you know, looking for free balls in behind the defence, Matty Cash has got the awareness to get in behind and Matoma doesn't have those natural defensive instincts. But what Aston Villa did, they did that on both flanks. They forced the... Brighton back four to narrow and they forced both of the wingers into a back six structure. What this meant was not only did uh, you know you have the threat in behind uh, or the threat into feet and then dribbling but also what it created was an overload in central midfield with with John McGinn moving from the wide area inside and getting on the ball. He created a situation where the two central midfielders of uh, Brighton had to pick up three men. So not only do we have a problem out wide with the both fullbacks super high, we've also got our you know three forwards pinning the Brighton back four. But we now got a kind of three v two in central midfield. We've created overloads all over the pitch by simply playing this structure and shape, kind of having the two fullbacks get high and having a narrow central midfielder, but also one acting as a forward. So let's take a look at the first goal because this really highlights exactly what I'm talking about. Matoma got caught out a few times against Manchester United with Diogo Delo 1v1. He beat him on two occasions, created two opportunities. Let's have a look at Matty Cash now. So jumping in on 12 minutes, you can clearly see Brighton's defensive shape. We've got the back four narrowed with the Aston Villa front three, Zaniolo, Ollie Watkins and Diaby. And then we've got the two wide players, Solly March top of shot, Mitoma bottom of shot on both of the Villa fullbacks in pretty high areas. Luca Dean's in possession. And of course, Matty Cash is on the right wing. The issue that we mentioned previously was not only have we got a problem with the, the back four being pinned or the back six being pinned, but the two central midfielders have got a lot of space to cover. And Villa have got a natural overload there with Douglas Louise, John McGinn and Kamara. Obviously, uh, the centre forward is dropping in to try and help out, but from this move doesn't help out enough. Moving the play on, Luca Dean drops the ball back to Douglas Louise. We can see the qualitative overload. Luca Dean on that left-hand side, Matty Cash on the right-hand side. From this position, Brighton are not in that bad an area. But because of the rotation of possession through centre-back, you're taking Evan Ferguson out of this midfield battle. Douglas Louise drops the ball back to Ezri Konza. Konza chests it, and Kamara picks up possession. We can now see both Danny Welbeck and Evan Ferguson taken out of the game, leaving the two central midfielders, Billy Gill, more and Henshelwood covering a lot of space. Moving the play on, we're starting to get a bit of problems. Matoma's in a halfway house of whether he should press the football in Kamara or deal with Matty Cash spinning in behind. As Diaby drops off, it creates another problem. Estepeñan is going to have to deal with Diaby dropping off the line. If Diaby plays first time, again receiving into feet, if he plays first time, Matty Cash is in behind the defence. We can see he's, he's onside, he's in line with uh, Adam Webster, uh, the far side centre half in the back for shape, but he doesn't, he retains possession, pulling it out, little combination play with Matty Cash to retain it back. From now, this is where the problem starts to open up. Those two central midfielders, as I mentioned before, they've just been defending the left-hand side of Villa's attacking structure, and now they're defending the right-hand side. Who's picking up the RB? Um, and you've got a real problem. John McGinn is such a smart footballer here. He just takes a look over his shoulder. I think, number one, to make sure Douglas Louise is going to make that defensive move if Aston Villa lose the ball. But also, I think he's looking for where the midfielder is around him because he knows now that he's back to goal. He can receive defeat and then turn into a really dangerous area. Because of how you can pull Brighton over and really stretch that 
six-man backline that they drop into, it opens up these inside channels. Of course, in this match, we saw a great goal from Jacob Ramsey in a similar position, but on the left-hand side of the pitch. This time, we see John McGinn creating. Really good first touch out of his feet, drives into that channel, and then simply, we can already see that Matty Cash is ready. He's in a sprinting position here before John McGinn's even turned. Matoma is caught on his toes. So simply... You know, you're going to get beat for pace. A great through ball from uh, John McGinn. Low cross into the box. Ollie Watkins does the rest. But that is a really, really key principle. You're pulling it over. You're creating space in the inside channels. You're then using that overload or that qualitative overload or that 1v1 overload after your numerical overload in central midfield. Lots of overloads that Emery used in this game and it worked really well. You know, I mentioned before, got that overload. 3v2 in central midfield. We've got a skill overload out wide want to frame it that way, where you've got a winger defending a fullback that's really attacking. And also you've got the threat of the forwards in behind to not only spin in behind, but drop off. It was brilliant from Emery in an attacking sense. Really, really good positional play. And quite frankly, one of the best performances we've seen ever against De Zerbe's Brighton. Six goals to one. Ollie Watkins with a hat-trick. Superb centre-forward play. Ollie Watkins, for me, is the perfect channel striker. This is the perfect game for him to play. You know, Brighton expose their channels like uh, Ange Postacoglu Spurs do. Ollie Watkins is that guy to put the ball in the back of the net. Three shots, three goals. But as well, Matty Cash and Luca Dean spent a lot of time attacking in the opponent's half, which I think gave them the advantage. Just looking at the average positions for Aston Villa, it paints a quite interesting picture. You've got the two centre-forwards um, in, of course, Diaby and Ollie Watkins playing high. Zaniolo's more naturally wide. John McGinn is actually more inside than uh, the central midfielder in Kamara, but he's tucked in. He's in that inside pocket, that inside channel where he created the, the goal uh, from, from that possession goal that we looked at previously. Brilliant tactics from Unai Emery and Brighton have uh, got to make another tactical evolution, which I can't wait to see. Deserby will have answers. Emery may have found the solution, but Deserby is just going to create more problems. I've been Statman Dave. Make sure to subscribe if you're new. Like the video. I'll see you all soon. Goodbye. Thanks for watching. If you've enjoyed this video, why not check out some more content on the Statman Dave YouTube channel?